Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy. I'm back, Eric Brown. Uh, you're not the usual moderator, but yet here I am again. Um, sitting here with a good friend of mine, I'm actually really pleased to welcome him to Tiny Talks, uh, Mr. Rashard Wright. Um, he is, um, I mean, I, I guess we can let him kind of say who he is, read his resume a little bit, just to give you a basic understanding of the expertise that he's going to bring to this table today when we talk about education. So, uh, Mr. Wright, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And, and good to see you, man. Yeah, I, man. I appreciate you and, um, you know, reconnecting with you. Yeah, man. Rather, you know, growing yeah, up sure. in the same area and knowing the same people. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate you having me here. Humbled to be here. Yeah, so I'm in, a, I'm in public education. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been uh, 20 years, 20 years for me in and started off as an English teacher. Mm -hmm. middle school English teacher and um, got into administration right away um, after three years teaching and uh, became a middle school assistant principal, high school assistant principal. I've been a middle school principal, I've been a high school principal. I've been a director. I've been an executive director. I've been an assistant superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a uh, chief of schools and now I am chief of staff at Newport News Public Schools. So I've been supervising principals and, and upper administration for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. So humble servant, loving it. I uh, love leading people and yeah. leading the people that lead people. Yeah, man. For, That's, for the people. That, for the people. And then, you know, I mean, you're from, like you mentioned, you know, we're from the same area. You, yeah, you know, man. I'm from Hampton, went to Bethel. Hello. My man went to kick tan over here. Yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. a product of the public school system. Absolutely. And yet you found yourself. I remember you, you and I were talking a few months ago. And education wasn't really something you were thinking about getting into coming out of high school. Nah. And you had an inspirational teacher slash coach yeah. kind of help guide you in a direction that led you to where you are today, 20 years later. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Well, there, you know, I've definitely only shared, you know, kind of a couple folks. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reality is I was uh, inspired by, number one, Billy Kennedy, who was the superintendent of Hampton at the time, yeah, who, yeah. who was extremely personable, remembered your name, mm -hmm. um, something I've definitely picked up from him that told me I would be a leader one day. Mm -hmm. He told me told me that as a junior in high school. Uh, Mrs. Boyd, my English teacher, tough on me, made sure I, I had a grasp of the Queen's English. <laughs> right. um, Mrs. Duckworth, you know, so many others. My football coach, Coach Newsom, um, allowed me to lead, mm -hmm. you know, as a quarterback, wide receiver. So there, there's so many, and I know I'm leaving, you know, others out. But mm -hmm. I, I just, I felt loved. I felt loved coming through school. Right. Were there challenges? Absolutely. But I, I felt like my teachers loved me. Mm -hmm. All of my teachers loved me, mm -hmm. regardless, uh, regardless if they looked like me or not. Right. I had a lot of people pour into me. Uh, I believe in a village. I don't know how it's become cliche, mm -hmm. but I do believe in a village. So, um, yeah, I've been, it's been, it's been a journey. It's sure. been a journey, but I had some great people right. in education to inspire me, to your point, right. uh, when you and I had dinner. So so with that being said, you you know, you know, said that you've been inspired. Like, So for me, uh, you know, I hear a lot of knocks on public school education. I'm also, like I said, I'm also the product of, uh, of, of public school, but some of the biggest influence I, influences I had outside of my own parents were my government teacher in the 12th grade, Mr. Hawkins, and my 11th grade history teacher, Mr. Smith. Uh, and, and you know, they were the ones who actually kind of steered me. And, like, I, you know, I studied poli sci and history when I got to college uh -huh. because of the influence that they instilled in my life. And I think that I, I bring that up to say, like, I really feel like there are a lot of times where you don't really appreciate the way some people pour into you in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we're both 40-ish at this point now. Yeah. And, you know, we can look back to when we were 18 and say, oh, yeah, that person really cared. They, people really care Absolutely. about their jobs. And, I've, and you know, teachers really – it takes a lot to be a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. it's, Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really job. one of these things where uh, they don't get enough credit. Um, and so it, all the educators out there, we definitely thank you. Um, what have, have you had challenges along the way? Like wh when you first got into teaching, for instance, mm -hmm. what were some of those challenges that you noticed, whether it was for yourself personally or with the students? Uh, 
Like, wh- where did you start teaching? I started teaching at Manchester Middle School okay. in uh, Chesterfield County. Up in Richmond. Uh, up, up in Richmond yeah, area. Yeah. Like, right on the Richmond-Chesterfield line, Hall sure. Street, Manchester Middle School. Okay. You know, had uh, started off as a 6th and 7th grade English teacher. Um, taught uh, English direct instruction. Mm-hmm. Uh, spent a lot of time with a variety of different students. Mm-hmm. Students that weren't being successful in the classroom. So, mm-hmm. I would say some of the challenges with me early on was being a new teacher sure. and wanting to make a difference right away. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about discipline and minority males and, and public mm-hmm. education right now. And that's a, that's another topic. But one of the challenges that I had uh, right away was knowing that all of the young men that may not have been paying attention, may not have been successful academically were being sent to my classroom. Right. You know, so I say a challenge, but it was also a blessing. Mm-hmm. Because I was able to uh, obviously make the focus, you know, a good lesson plan right. and make sure that they were, you know, succeeding academically. Mm-hmm. But also I was given that personal opportunity to make sure that they knew that I saw them. Right. And uh, not just them, all of my students. Mm-hmm. And I, I've always believed in teaching with love. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, everyone that you're around really should feel like the most important person in the room. Yeah. And uh, and that's yeah. that's the way that I approach teaching. I made sure that my students knew that I loved them. Mm-hmm. But the challenge was, uh, Eric, honestly, man, I didn't stay long enough. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've felt that along my career. Sure. That I was so interested in the next step and mm-hmm. the next move. Mm-hmm. So the challenge for me was uh, just taking on so much, man. Right. You know, having to do so much. But right. Yeah, that's so, where I started. So then you taught for three years mm-hmm. and then I'm guessing made that pivot to the admin side. And I made the pivot quick, right? You know, quick, and that's kind of what I'm alluding to: mm-hmm. not staying somewhere long enough, sure. You know, to uh, see what you've planted actually come to fruition right. and to grow mm-hmm. and to bloom. So then I made the transition um, to assistant principal of a middle school. Went down to Gloucester County. Oh, and I was a diversity hire for sure. Sure, right. Yeah. Whether whether <laughs> look, whether they said it publicly or not, but I appreciate that. <laughs> right. Yeah, Gloucester, yeah, I can yeah, imagine. Yeah, Gloucester. So mm-hmm. so, you know, I, I, I know again, you and I we've spoken a little bit. I, and I know you've actually had though you might not have stayed long enough to see the seeds that you planted, as you mentioned, you've actually jumped around locally here in Virginia oh, a little bit. So I know you were in Richmond, the Richmond area, down to Gloucester. <laughs> Uh, you were in Virginia Beach at one point. Virginia you're Beach. up here in Hampton. You were, you know, Hampton City Schools, and now you're in Newport News. So when you're looking uh, at, over the course of your, I don't say your rise. That sounds like you're a superhero. I mean, you are. You are a real superhero. But I don't. I don't want to make it seem like yeah. some type of giant movie thing. Uh, the point is, as you've made your your moves from one place to the other. What did you notice from one school system to the other where there may have been disadvantages for some versus others? Um, you know, I know that, you know, we, I've talked about it. We had, we had a, um, our last panelist, we were talking about um, housing was our, was our main topic. And we, we talked about how, you know, we, we grew up here. You know, sure. I grew up right here in Hampton, half a mile, mile and a half from where we're recording right now. Um, and my schooling experience was completely different than those, of the, the handful of people that I knew from York County, which is five minutes from here in the opposite direction. Um, what were some of the experiences or what did you notice about, you know, going from maybe the Richmond area to Gloucester to Virginia Beach, Hampton, Newport News? Did you really, that you can really speak to in this in this kind of moment? Well, you know, let, let's just start with, you know, how, how we look at school divisions and mm. let's start with geography, right? So right. you have, you have your rural school divisions. I've mm. been in your, your Gloucester. I've been in your Middlesex counties. You have your, um, suburban quote unquote. Mm. I had a little bit of that in one portion of Isle of Wight, the Smithfield side, even sure. though down in Windsor, it was rural. Yeah. You have your suburban area. You know, one would assume that Virginia beach is, you know, quote unquote suburban. Right. So that was an experience that I had. Parts of Chesterfield mm-hmm. had that suburban feel. Mm-hmm. And then you look at urban, you know, uh, we, you know, folks would consider Newport News to be quote unquote urban. Parts yeah. of Hampton could be, you know, quote unquote urban. I, mm-hmm. I did a stint down in Houston, um, mm-hmm. HISD, and I, I saw every part, you know, 
out out in the sticks, yeah. you know, down you know the uh, southern airport, yeah. uh, hobby, and then you also you know had uh, you know suburbia, and then you also had some poverty. So to contextualize how I look at different school divisions, I would say that every every city, mm-hmm. every county, they have their own feel, they have their own culture. Yeah. But here's one common denominator: no matter where you are. Mm-hmm. You have great teachers, yeah. and you have great teachers, mm-hmm. and you have great teachers. Right. And a great teacher, no matter where they work, mm-hmm. no matter the school division, can make an unmistakable impact on the life of a child. Mm-hmm. So I know that we we think um, urban, old challenges, right. you know, someone's from a, a challenging background. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, if you watch the news, they, they're totally going to remind you that urban's challenging. Right. But the reality is this, uh, people that go into public education, hopefully mm-hmm. are going into public education, regardless of where they end up living and where they serve, mm-hmm. because they love children. Right. Or they love content, mm-hmm. and they have to learn to love children, right? right. It'd, be, it'd be great if you had skill and will, right? right. Skill from a content standpoint, mm-hmm. but you had the will to make a difference in the life of a child. Right. So I would say, absolutely, there were differences. Mm-hmm. In, in every school division. Um, I like to cook. We talked about that a little bit, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, you like jambalaya? Love it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Jambalaya is such a complex dish, mm-hmm. but look at all the different ingredients. Right. And I look at my career and I feel like I've, I've experienced the, you know, the making or the preparation of a good jambalaya, yeah. you know, with multiple types of meats and multiple yep. types of veggies and ingredients. And, mm-hmm. and that's kind of how I look at my experiences in, in all these different school divisions. Mm-hmm. But um, what I would say brings it all together, mm-hmm. you know, from a glue standpoint is good teaching is good teaching, man. Right. It doesn't matter where you are. That's real. That's it. That's real. That's I mean, it, it really, I, I've, I, you know, I've gone to private school too. And some of the, honestly, most, some of the most impactful teachers I've ever had came from my public school experience. And that's not to say that my private school experience wasn't good. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I've realized it's, it's just a different type of love, man. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I, you know, we got to salute people like, like you uh, for kind of viewing things through the, t- through the telescope, through the lens that you do. Yeah. Because it really could just be a paycheck. It really could just be, yeah. I, I, you know, I remember when I was in college, uh, graduated from Hampton University. The last year I did um, student teaching slash substitute teaching. Yeah. And it was a ball. I had a great time. But I actually knew people who only worked as teachers. One of the, like, I remember the first year I did it, uh, when I was student teaching, I worked with a, with a woman who told me the only reason she worked was to pay for her health insurance for okay. her family because okay. of whatever her husband's career uh, was didn't really like the health insurance was just too crazy. She didn't care for the job. It was literally a she could have gotten you know picked up a job anywhere, but it was mm-hmm. what she what she got into. I also know that she had the most trouble. And then that that six months that I was with her, every single child that got in trouble they sent to me. You know why she struggled? What's that? Well, number one, her heart wasn't in it. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. But young people have amazing crap detectors. Right, yeah, so they knew yes. they they knew she was full of it, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So they they smell that blood in the water, yeah. And, um, so they're gonna intentionally mm-hmm. terrorize her, right? Yeah, yeah. But shame on her, yeah. Because you you should never be in education mm-hmm. if you're not in it to win it, right? You should absolutely be in love with the the good and the bad of mm-hmm. the role, right? So uh, they you know yeah they they saw through that man. Yeah, you know, I, I really think that people don't <laughs> give. That was one of the things I learned too is that kids we don't give children enough credit Bro. for how smart they actually are, how man. how how deep they can actually critically think. What? I remember when I was working with uh 3rd and 4th grade special ed and you know they uh they come to come to me for a, a certain period of, of the day mm-hmm. and uh you know we're going over their work and I always I would go home and wonder why these kids were in special ed, because nothing about them said special ed to me. Oh, you don't have enough time to unpack that. <laughs> yeah, probably not. But it was really interesting to see how I had all the and there were mostly little boys. I probably had thirteen kids in the class, give or take, and I think ten of them were boys. And so what I just they remember, look like. Oh, you know what they look like? They look like oh, us. They okay. look like you and I. Okay. 
Oh, um, all right. I remember one of the girls was white, and the other two were one was Asian, one was an Asian little a little girl, and a black girl. But yeah, I remember thinking to myself, you know, like we're sitting, there, you know, I had no problems with them, no disciplinary actions, um, no uh, real struggle. I mean, there were obviously some subjects that a kid might struggle with here and there, but I feel like that's natural. I struggled with, I hate math. You know, once I got to the out, past that algebra two level, I, you know, I might as well have, they could have put me in that class, you know, like I just didn't get it. Not everybody can be a rocket scientist. And so, um, you know, I, I just remember thinking to myself, I actually had this conversation with my mom back in the day. Like, I just don't get it. These kids are, they're sharp. They get mm-hmm. it. And I realized it all started with just talking to them. Day one, just day one. Hey, what music do you like? Hey, yeah, I saw that movie, and it also helped that half of, half of them I knew like an older brother or sister or something like that from from growing up with them. So we it, just talking to these kids, and once, like you said, they smell that you're normal, if you mm-hmm. will, and you're not going to BS them. Yeah. They'll give you your, their time and attention. And so, um, you know, again, uh, you know, we talked earlier. I don't want this to. This is not like a woe is me, woe is us. Oh, type of conversation, yeah. Um, yeah, you know. I, exactly. I, I do like to like reiterate that, but at the same time, though, um, you know, I feel like there are so many solutions out here to, and we'll get to them. Uh, you know, some ideas, perhaps. Sure. Um, about how to help educational systems, particularly here in. I, mean, I have a heart for for the seven five. You know, I grew up in Northern Virginia. I moved down here. Uh, I went to Davis in the eighth grade. Moved down here then. At, and you know went on to Bethel but this is home yeah. this is where I'm from yeah. um and so I've got a real heart for this and to see slash hear that there was a fall off or a drop off in any particular way in the Hampton slash Newport News public school system really kind of hurts my heart a little bit and I don't know necessarily how much of this is true how much of a drop off there's been since we graduated in the late 90s um, but that's also why you're here <laughs> to help yeah. because I know there are a lot of, I hear people talk about, I don't like Hampton because the crime is high. And then I look at the statistics and I'm like, it's no different than it was 25 yeah. years ago. I don't like Hampton because my kids don't get X. Our kids didn't have X 20 years ago when we went through the school system. So what is it? What's the truth and what is it? Well, you know? well, something that is the truth is the, the adults decide um, which stigmas become attached to school divisions. Sure. Kids, kids don't decide that. Right. Right. So, you know, we never hear a child say, Hey, you know, you shouldn't come to this school division. No, they're hearing that at home. Mm-hmm. You know, they, and uh, so this, first of all, this area has never dropped off this, okay. this area. Let me just, you know, obviously something's in the water, but this is mm-hmm. one of the most beautiful, ge- you know, beautiful geographically yeah. um, area, the history Mm-hmm. In this area, um, the industry, mm-hmm. um, the, the military population. Um, thank you for your service, by the way, all our military folks. We appreciate you. When you look at Huntington Ingalls, north of Grumman, you look yeah. at the shipyard, the ships that are, the, the carriers that are being built out of this area. We yeah. have to pay attention, you know, to that. Um, the athletes that have come out of this area, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, the musicians that have come out of, you know, this this area. So I. This area has not fallen off. Right. Our schools have not fallen off. Now, have people moved out of Hampton and Newport News and moved to Williamsburg, York County, mm-hmm. Pocosin? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But look at what's happening economically right now in Hampton and Newport News. There's a reinvestment relative to the schools, which which really is what we're it's what we're talking about. You know, we have minority school divisions. Right. Bottom line. Yeah. And and I and I think that's the underbelly and the undercurrent mm-hmm. of what people are describing. Right. People are describing minority school divisions. Mm-hmm. And guess what? A lot of times these descriptions are coming from other areas. They can come from economics. They can, oh, you know the most popular one? Mm-hmm. Other than saying that these are black school divisions, um, people bring up crime. Right. Mm-hmm. People bring up their perceptions of others. So you hear you're hearing perceptions, which is unfortunate. And it's not fair right. to the amazing, beautiful, hardworking families that are right here in Hampton and Newport News. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have our challenges like everyone else. But again, great teachers in, in both school divisions mm-hmm. um, continuing to invest when it comes to opportunities 
mm-hmm. for our students as they come out of high school, right? right? So whatever you want to be, I, I believe Hampton and Newport News in particular have worked hard to have those options mm-hmm. for students. Right. People are going to think what they think, but every year out of all these high schools, you have amazing kids going to Ivy League schools. Yeah. You got kids going to the military. You got kids going into nursing. You got folks starting their own businesses. You know, whatever the narrative is, mm-hmm. it's up. It's up to us as adults and as taxpayers to control that narrative. Right. If someone wants to leave because they think it's dangerous, mm-hmm. you, you can be in danger in the suburbs. You can be in, in danger out in the country. Right. All right. It's it's that adult's perception. They mm-hmm. are the carriers of the negative stigma that we hear sometimes in this area. I don't buy it, brother. I don't. I don't. Bri- I don't buy I mean, it. Ab. You shouldn't have to. I mean, you work <laughs> in it. You 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 get the numbers across your desk. Yeah, yeah. How do we? So then, how will we change that per- that perception? How? What? What? I think, like I said, it grieves me when I hear people complaining about the school system here, and I think to myself, I did okay. Yeah. <laughs> We did well. You we know, did well before, even before standards of learning, before SOL. Right. Yeah. That you know, it's funny. I, I missed that. They uh they piloted the SOL test. I think my junior or senior year in high school, and like I remember they piloted it and they said, "Hey, this doesn't really count." You know, whatever. This is just something that we're going to move forward with going on. I think it started with the class of two thousand and one, and I remember half my class was like, "Oh, this doesn't count." Abacadabra, all the way down yeah. that thing. Yeah. But, um. Even with that being said, you know, I I was not an SOL kid. My younger sister, she's five years younger than me, is an SOL kid. Um, and the I don't, you know, I, I've heard oh, we can talk about that for a second. There are there are parents who just don't like the SOL. Sure. And I don't maybe because I don't know what it truly is. Yeah. Can you so, kind of explain what that is? Yeah. So it, we have to go back to No Child Left Behind. Right. And that happened under, um, you know, President Bush. Bush. Yeah. And, and really that entire time, that time period was about accountability. Mm-hmm. And it was about increasing the accountability with regards to school divisions. And, and, I, and I'll tell you this. I, I think there are a lot of good things that came out of that time. And I'll mm-hmm. get to SOS in a minute. We started paying more attention mm-hmm. to data, mm-hmm. and we started really looking at data trends. Mm-hmm. Um, you spoke to one earlier, and you didn't even know you were doing it when you talked about when you were subbing in third and fourth grade, and you were, you know, helping out in the special ed classroom, and they were little brown boys. Mm-hmm. That's called disproportionality. So right. there's a disproportionate amount of minority males being identified as special ed, mm-hmm. right? Just like there's a disproportionate amount of minority males that are being identified as gifted. Mm. Those processes, uh, they seem different, but they're one and the same. Interesting. All right. So we need to consider that. But back to No Child Left Behind, it became mandatory that we pay attention to content areas. It became mandatory that we start testing, that we start benchmarking, that we uh, start formatively and summatively assessing students to see where they are. So then we then we can then respond. Right. So guess what? That just that started showing some showing the ugly side. Right. Really, really that microscope started showing that we we had kids that were failing. Right. So was there a lot of pressure? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So all states mm-hmm. had to adopt a standardized testing model. Yeah. Virginia, which always ranks about fourth in the nation. Mm-hmm. So people don't like SOLs, but mm-hmm. you know, we have one of the best public education systems in the nation. Mm-hmm. Always ranked fourth or fifth. Yeah. We adopted the standards of learning, which we've eased back some sure. from e- expecting, you know, that test. We've, mm-hmm. we've kind of eliminated um, some of those tests on the state level. But and I personally believe, you know, it, it started to ask us, you know, to inspect what we expect. Yeah. And uh, we had to raise the standards. That's we had to yeah. raise the standards and we had to stop ignoring children of color. Yeah. Um, English language learners, those that don't um, speak English as a first language, right? Yeah. Um, we we couldn't identify, we couldn't uh, excuse me, ignore special ed students anymore. Right. All right. We we could not ignore these gaps. Right. So uh, that's what it's been about. You know, mm. it's been it's been about truly ensuring that everyone everyone gets an opportunity. So right. has there been more pressure? Absolutely. 
I feel like I feel like the only people who would have really truly complained about SOLs were uh, teachers who have been teaching for a while, the veterans. Mm-hmm. Um, now I may be wrong, but this is why again why you're here. If I'm looking at this, if I've been teaching for 25 years, and I'm now being told I have to start teaching to something. Mm-hmm. But also at the same time, as you mentioned, it kind of shows some of the failures. The things that you think, you know, my way works, you know, been using the same textbook for 10 years yeah. and, you know, my, I pass my kids and whatever, but then they get out there with no skill set or no real understanding of even the basics of anything. Yeah. Um, I can see how that'd be a real problem for some. But again, you know, you said, you, you spoke to something that I think is really important that I didn't even know. And I did I did research before I sat down with you. <laughs> was that Virginia's fourth, fifth, you know, the top oh, percentile of, of, of the country in, in terms of our public school education. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, I kind of take, I'm not going to lie, I take a little pride in that. <laughs> you know, nice. um, I think as you should as well, you know, obviously you are in this, you're knee deep in it. So, with you, you're the chief of staff of Newport News Public Schools, mm-hmm. and you say you oversee principals. So, what exactly does that job description kind of like? What does that mean exactly? How 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 are, how does your job? What does sure. your job look like? Yeah, we're, really, it's a catch-all. Um, okay. You know, as a designee for the superintendent, being mm-hmm. a number two in our organization, mm-hmm. um, working directly with the superintendent every day, and and really every department in the organization. Mm-hmm. My you know, I humbly say my specialty is leadership, leadership development. Right? Okay. That's not only a passion of mine, that's something that I've spent a lot of time in from a research standpoint and a, and a practical standpoint. So when I say I work with principals, that's I would say that's my primary mm-hmm. department of school leadership, my department. I have principal supervisors mm-hmm. that uh, I oversee mm-hmm. that work directly with the principals of schools, okay, right? Understood. So we have 27,000 students in our school division, 42, 42 mm-hmm. schools, uh, 42 principals, you know, well over 60 or so assistant principals. So my day-to-day is to ensure that we are mm-hmm. providing the right support mm-hmm. to leaders sure. so that they can lead their builders. So you support leaders so they can support teachers that can make an impact with children. Yeah. And when you're supporting leaders, it's, you know, it's um, relational, mm-hmm. instructional, and situational. Right. Because all leaders really need to have that that tripartite, mm-hmm. you know, level of, of excellence. Yeah. You know, high relationships, they need to be instructional leaders, mm-hmm. and then they need to have some situational awareness. You got right. a lot of smart people with no situational awareness. No street smarts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Meaning they don't put their ear to the rail, so they don't, they, you know, the train's coming. That's right. why they're getting hit by a train. Well, you should hear a train well before it comes. Right. Right? Ground starts vibrating. Mm-hmm. Rails start shaking. Mm-hmm. You know, some magnetic currents coming. Right. You should hear it. You should feel it. So... Uh, working with leaders every day and uh, okay. being responsive, being a spokesperson for the school division and really just serving whatever I'm asked to do. Right. And also personally, mm-hmm. I want to inspire. Yeah. I want to inspire. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to motivate people to be great every day. And even if you don't feel great, mm-hmm. you better give it your all. You better I, give it your, you I better give great. it your all. I feel great. Just <laughs> I'm feeling inspired right now. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting because I do know that, uh, I think most people, I don't, first of all, I don't think, like I, I said earlier, teachers aren't getting enough credit. Uh, not, not enough at all. But the educational system as a whole, principals aren't getting a lot of credit either. You know, it, it's interesting, you know, when we were young, we're, we're not all of us, but some of us are just kind of instinctively trained, if you will, to think the worst of the people that oversee you. Uh, you walk into school and you, you, the, pr- the principal, the assistant principal walks by and you tighten up mm-hmm. for no reason at all. I was even that way. I was a good kid. I probably got detention twice all through high school and for my own, for my own tardiness and nothing, I wasn't even thugging, nothing, nothing for real. But at the end of the day, there's this weird, uh, sense of, I don't want to say a lack of respect. It's a lack of understanding, mm-hmm. I think, for the job that you guys do. And so um, as you're moving forward, as you are now, you know, I, you've been at this in this position for a couple of years now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, Year three. Yeah. Year three. Yeah. So what is it that you hope to do for the school district, for your, for your leaders, for the leaders below you, um, 
like what's like how do how do you plan to how do you plan to like what's your plan for getting them I know you you're good at inspiring how do you see the trickle down working though from you down to these students I know you said earlier you didn't get the chance to see the the seeds that you planted mm-hmm. but you're still planting seeds absolutely you're you're more like the rain at this point mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and just and you're absolutely. and and these people you know that you work with might be the farmers. So what is it that you're you're really hoping to see turn around in Newport News? Well, we're well well um on our way mm-hmm. and um and also that that also speaks to those even even before us. Mm-hmm. Um Newport News has a really strong foundation. Um Newport News is managed uh, very well fiscally. Mm-hmm. Um you know Newport News has a very diverse um you know population, you know yeah. in the city. Yeah. Um you know the the, the city has uh, made a lot of strides when it comes to just economic growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think in this particular role and just leadership in general and the way I look at it, Eric, I, I hope that number one, all of our schools make the academic mark. Right. So that's the goal when it comes to just being accredited, mm-hmm. making sure that our schools are accredited and making sure that we can close the gaps that exist in many of our schools, mm-hmm. whether it be with uh, you know, our, our black students, with mm-hmm. our low socioeconomic students, with again, our English, uh, English as a second language students, right. our students uh, with um, our special ed students, mm-hmm. special education students with special populations. So to keep working with leaders so they know which levers to pull right. in their individual schools mm-hmm. because all schools are different. Right. Different neighborhoods, different That's, dynamics, I was different ask numbers. About that, yeah. oh, they're also very different. So yeah. working with leaders to make sure they know which levers to pull mm-hmm. to ensure their success. Don't right. try to be like the other school. Right. All right. You know, so accept those uniquenesses and right. those beauties and those dynamics representative of your school. Mm-hmm. And then let's push, let's make that mark academically mm-hmm. and let's have fun, let's have fun doing it. And also continue to assess your culture every day. What does your culture feel like? Right. Because people people don't work for people that they don't like. <laughs> yeah. they, you, you really, really don't. Yeah. All right? And I'm not saying that you have to like me, mm-hmm. you know, but you can like what we're doing. Right. You don't have to like me, but you can at least believe. We should all be pushing towards something we believe in. Right. I'm not saying you have to think, think I had the best idiosyncrasies in the world. Sure. But we should have a common belief. So sure. that's, to answer your question, that is the expectation for every building every leader is to know how to pull levers to ensure that your school is successful. So how, so you, you spoke to something that actually I was, I was thinking about uh, earlier, which was you've got schools, you know, you, you said how many students, 60,000 or something? 27,000. 27,000. That's a, yeah. It kind of blew my mind when you said it. Um, 27,000 students. And you know, people for, and I know we're speaking to Newport news a lot because this is where you, you currently are. But one of the things that I think is really interesting is Newport News is huge. Mm-hmm. City Hampton is too in terms of population, but like Newport News is really big. Yep. And you've got a totally different dynamic at Woodside mm-hmm. than you do all the way down Jefferson and Warwick in, in Eastern Newport News. So how do you uh, keep, you kind of, you spoke to it a second ago, which was like, don't look at what the next school is doing. What's your culture looking like? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. How, uh, like, I, I'm, I'm assuming that there are probably some discrepancies between some of the folks who live uptown versus downtown or whatever the case may be. How are you motivating, how, how is your motivational style when it comes to addressing stud- uh, uh, leaders in um, schools that are maybe a little bit more socio- socioeconomically hit? Versus some of the others. Sure. So I, th- I think, you know, it's funny you bring up a good point and it's standard and I'm mm-hmm. not correcting you, but I have to say it like sure, this. Do. Number one, our job has to be, you know, number one, to eliminate discrepancies. Sure, right. Or the, or the perception that there, you know, uh, worse discrepancies or more challenges in a particular community. Is that the case? I, I, I would say so. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes. So l- let's just start. Let's just start with uh, basics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are, are students fed? Mm-hmm. Do they feel safe? Are we able to provide them the resources that they need? Right. Mm-hmm. So resources may entail food. Yeah. Resources could entail supplies. Um, and our schools have to be safe. And our schools have to be places where um, teachers love their students, regardless of where they come from. 
you know, differences in schools, there are always differences in schools. They're different right. cultures, right? right? They're different mascots. Right. They're, di they're different neighborhoods. But something that's happening in schools is when you look at different specialty programs that may exist in different schools, mm -hmm. you, you don't always have we don't always have the neighborhood schools that schools used to be back then. You know, right. back in the day, you know, you walk out of your front door and your school might have been like right there. Right. Or um, nowadays, you know, students are being bused potentially to different specialty programs, right. um, regardless of their zones. Uh, you have uh, lottery systems where parents can apply to go to a different school. Mm -hmm. But to, your, to the other piece that you were talking about, I love the idea. It goes back to adults, right? Mm -hmm when you were describing how schools get stigmas mm -hmm. and, and even in this area, Hampton, Newport news, are they good schools? We have to eliminate that narrative mm -hmm. by lifting up all of our students, no matter where they come from mm -hmm. and celebrating their uniquenesses, celebrating where they come from mm -hmm. and always focus on their examples of excellence, right? right. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for excellence. And right. I think that with all our different communities and, Everywhere where our students uh, may live and lay their heads, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter. We should be focusing on their gifts and their talents. Right. That's what's going to, it's, let's just say we have someone that's in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. You can always, you know, wake up their hearts. Right. You can always match their re the resources we give them, match that to their dreams. You know, we should be dream matchers, right? Right. That's what public education should be. We should be inspiring kids if if they come from a challenging background, mm -hmm. that they can achieve whatever, and I and that's not that's not lip service, right? right. That's not that's not just that's not just talk, right? You know, I I believe that, and I try to um, surround myself with people that believe that, man. To so, so to that last point, how would you inspire someone who say you're a young man, you grew up in East End Newport News, and the only ones you've ever seen it out seen make it out are the Mike Vicks of the world. So you think you got to be able to throw a football or, you know, be good at a sport, you know, uh, because there aren't a lot of, like, I grew up in a neighborhood where my next door neighbor, black, a black family, the, the father was a doctor mm -hmm. on the other side of that, a, another doctor across the street, a doctor, my mom's a lawyer. Like I grew up in a different environment where I didn't look to athletes as a way out. How would you inspire? Like, like I actually think, you know, you just being in a position that you're, you're in now, you can kind of touch people in a way to let them know that there's something beyond that. But how would you inspire someone who thinks their only way out is the, one of those one in a million type of lifestyles? Well, first of all, I, I never make the assumption that they think that that's their only way out. Or, one of the things you said earlier, AB, that was so, so, so beast, man, was uh, we, we underestimate kids, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we still, adults. Probably do. See, we got adult issues, man. Mm -hmm. We always look from the lens of what adults think. Kids, no matter where they come from, mm -hmm. are dreaming every day. That's real. We just don't ask them all the time. Mm. First of all, every child that comes from a challenging background of poverty doesn't necessarily look look, look to be, you know, look to get out by way of rapping right. and, and throwing Throw a football. football yeah. We think that. ESPN says that. Wavy TV 10 says that, yeah. you know, and I, I love Wavy. I'm a Wavy person. I'm talking about it, the media news, general, the news, yeah, right? It's, sure. it's the media. I think what we have to do is, first of all, if you throw, if you throw a tight spiral, keep throwing it. You're right. Because I love football <laughs> and I want to watch you play. But also, what are your academic interests? Mm -hmm. Because I believe education decides what you eat for dinner. Right. I've always said that. Mm -hmm. Education will decide what you eat for dinner. Now, how you acquire that education I mean, you could you could go to ECPI. Mm -hmm. You can go to New Horizons. All right, you can you can go into the military. You right. can get that education by way of trades. We right. underestimate that trades, right. right? So, to your question around someone that may be coming from challenge, again, let's match our resources with their dreams. And guess what? Throw the football along right. the way, right? But get your grades up, right? More importantly, identify what you want to do. Because if you identify what you want to do mm -hmm. and you do it really, really well, yeah. you can come out of any situation. That's and right. again, we have to stop limiting. We limit our scope as adults. We limit their abilities based on what we think. Right. Let's let's uh let's provide resources and match resources with the dreams of young people. Yeah. And that's in general. That's not just in Newport News Hampton. That's just in general. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And and sprinkling a little bit of heart, man. 
We got to we got to love each other. And I'm glad you said that because I don't think people really do think what you said wasn't uh you didn't reinvent the wheel, but what you said was actually very profound because a lot of people aren't necessarily thinking about the fact that oh yeah, kids actually know how to think. They observe other things other oh, than man. a rapper or an athlete or whatever the case may be, you know, entertainment. So, you know, I'm I'm glad you spoke to that and I'm glad you recognize that. Um we're perpetuating the, we're perpetuating what we see as a mediocrity mm-hmm. when we think that children that come from a certain background mm-hmm. only see themselves doing certain things. things. Right. No, we only see them doing certain things. That's <laughs> that's great. So um I actually want to take a left turn here. I kind of don't want I don't want to I really don't want to <laughs> get off this topic. I feel like every time we do one of these, and my All partners right. over there will attest to this, every time we do one of these, I feel like these conversations can go for like four or five hours. I understand. Because everything is so complex and there's there are a lot of complexities to all of this, but solutions. I wanna I wanna ask one other question and then we I really do want to jump into to solutions. It's about seven fifty five. So um Last question. We are now in this 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 COVID corona <laughs> this this entire craze. The kids have been out of school for a minute. I think before did y'all just go back today? Today was your first day. What, the twenty second of February. Uh, Pre K through three um, went started today. Pre K through three. So how, what are the challenges that you have seen? Because all because again a lot of people you know and we probably have about a thousand people that watch this when we go live with these give or take. There are going to be a lot of parents that watch this and a lot of parents who, and I, you know, I, I talk to parents all the time. I have no children myself, but you know, when I'm at work, I hear, I hear sometimes people just, uh, our, I know our children's pastor is always praying for, for educators because there's, there's been so much and parents mm-hmm. because there's been such, um, it seems like the kids aren't the only ones that have had to learn something new in the last 12 months. Um, what are the challenges that you've seen with virtual learning? Um, and what are some of the wins? Because at the end of the day, you know, I, the, the world hasn't burned down yet, you know? Um, so can you speak to some of the, the challenges and some of the wins that you've seen through virtual and what you kind of hope to see over the next six months to a year as you guys start sure. transitioning? And back this is, in? this is all school divisions nationally, right? right? Um, first of all, let, let's talk about something that we, we didn't know we could do. And I think a lot of school divisions always wonder, hey, can we give every child a device? Right. Well, guess what? In a matter of 60 days, and I don't know the exact time period um, for every school division, but in a short amount of time, we, we all went from preparing to one day have every child have a device mm-hmm. to giving every child a device. Right. So think about that. Right. The pandemic forced us to make sure everyone had a device. Mm-hmm. When philosophically, I remember the, the days where we said, oh, they, they kid, kids can't work from computers on their own. Right. You know, they're just going to break them. Right. Or how, how are we going to do this? Mm-hmm. We've learned how to do it. Mm-hmm. We've been forced to do it. Right. So that's a win. Right. That's a challenge that also became a win. Mm-hmm. We, all, we also all learned that um, we can feed everybody. Mm. Look how fast that changed. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Look, look how just on a dime now school divisions nationally, they're, they're feeding children. We're feeding children. Yeah. We're feeding their families. So we, we just eliminated barriers. Mm-hmm. We took challenges like technology mm-hmm. and challenges like meals and eliminated that barrier right away. Right. Within a matter. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's no longer an issue. We're now being forced to innovate. Mm-hmm. We're innovating. Right. So are there challenges with virtual learning? Are there challenges with people saying, you're you're muted, you're muted. That's the most popular. (laughs) You're you're muted. Right. right? Are there challenges with virtual backgrounds? We've all seen the memes. Yeah. We've we've all seen the videos where, you know, somebody. I'm not a cat. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, with somebody's walking, walking behind, you know, that, uh, that child or that individual. And maybe you see something funny. Maybe you see something inappropriate. Yeah. But we are, we're operating in a time and we're doing things that we never thought we could do. Right. That's pretty cool. Now we've lost a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think today um, it was actually just released day. 500,000 people have Mm -hmm. lost their lives to COVID. And that's really sad um, as we navigate this pandemic and 
we uh, you know utilize these mitigation strategies to all stay safe, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned your second vaccine, so get, getting the vaccine is a big thing. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a possibility that we're morphing into a new age of education. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever go back to doing it the way that we did. Interesting. I think that now we're going to do things different. When I say we, I mean just educators in general. Yeah. We've we have been forced mm -hmm. to look at childcare. Right. You know, think about how think about how many individuals had not spent time had not spent time, excuse me, mm -hmm. at home with their family because they were so busy working. Right. And then all of a sudden you're at home with your family. Right. You know? Now, if you look at your kids differently, yeah, I'd like to say we probably pay a little more attention mm -hmm. to our children yeah. because we were so busy. We were so busy being busy, and then we had to get busy taking care of our children. Yeah. So challenges have resulted in wins, mm -hmm. and I don't think public education will ever be the same in a good way, in, in a good way. Okay. Well, that's encouraging, actually, because I know that there are a lot of people who are, uh, I think technology freaks out a Freaks out most people. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, at least you know, speaking to Newport News, you guys were able to uh, rally and get every student a device. That speaks that speaks highly of the fact that you got you know like adapting with the times and just understanding that understanding early that things aren't going to be the same. So uh, props to that. So what do you think? Like so again, you know. Solutions for the future. If you were, let's let's play a little game. If you were the superintendent of all super, you were the big boss. The I guess the superintendent of all superintendents is called the secretary of education. Right. <laughs> what would you like to see? You know, you, again, you've been in admin almost twenty years at mm -hmm. this point. Uh, you've seen a lot. You've been through a lot. You've learned a lot. Um, you know, I, you know. I, Again, the media says that American education isn't uh, quite the same compared to other country, other you know, uh, first world countries. That's what the media says. Yeah. I don't know. What would you like to see um, if you had an opportunity to sit down and, and maybe not even like necessarily Secretary of Education of the United States, but if you really could make a make a a, a case for some type of positive change, even here in Virginia, what would you like to see? Wow. See, I didn't tell him that this question was coming. <laughs> I definitely did. Well, a, a, a couple things, a couple things, maybe, well, a couple's two, so maybe more than a couple. First of all, an added emphasis on making sure that uh, all of our children mm -hmm. uh, feel loved and cared for right. when they come to school. Right. All right. Safe we can't, environments. Yeah. yeah, we can't, we can't control what happens at home. And we also can't uh, prevent um, challenges at home when it comes to social and emotional. Mm -hmm. But we can uh, focus in on schools being safe, safe emotionally. Right. And uh, to that, that magic wand that you're asking about, you know, to wave that wand and make sure mm -hmm. that those that are in education will make sure kids feel loved and cared for. Right. You know what I mean? Kid, kids that don't feel love at home come to school for love. Mm -hmm. If you get love at home, you come to school to learn. Right. Bottom line. Right. So that's that's a basic. I'm all about love. I call it heart work. It's mm -hmm. about not hard work, it's heart work. Mm -hmm. It's being able to provide love. Number two is that we keep innovating. Right. You know, just let's keep innovating. Let, let's keep, let's think that people say think outside the box. There is no box. Right. You're right. So again, let's match resources with the dreams of, of students and let's mm -hmm. ask them what they want. That's sure. student voice. Mm -hmm. So an environment where we match resources mm -hmm. with the dreams of students so that they can excel. Although we have standards of learning and then we have all these prerequisites and credits that you have to, that you have to um, attain, yep. you know, in order to, to make the mark, mm -hmm. we need to continue to innovate. And the third piece is this, um, and, and it's, we've seen this over the past year or so. Okay. Um, is to always make sure that race and culture don't just remain the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, we've operated with race and culture being the elephant in the room. Yeah. We need to pull that elephant from the corner mm -hmm. and let's have the conversation. 
Right. And let's make sure that everyone feels seen and everyone feels heard mm -hmm. and that we celebrate differences. Right. We should be celebrating differences as opposed to perseverating around similarities. Right. We always want people to be similar so that we can agree. Right. No, 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 no. We need to celebrate differences. Right. Okay. So my three, my three pieces, kids feel, feeling loved and cared for. Mm -hmm. My second piece is matching resources with the dreams of our students mm -hmm. and innovate while we're doing it. Mm -hmm. What do they want? What do they need? And number three is we need to be a culturally competent group of educators. Culturally competent group of educators. We need to be like a that. culturally competent group of educators mm -hmm. and we need to see each other mm -hmm. based on our differences mm -hmm. and celebrate that. Yeah. We shouldn't we, we shouldn't expect everyone to be the same. And no one's better than the other right. because of their differences. Right. That's the elephant in the room too. Uh, so I like I like that. I promise <laughs> I like that. Um you know one of the things I was thinking about as we were talking, which kind of led me to ask you the question, what would you like to see mm -hmm. being done was, you know, we started talking and, and the point that both of us hit on was the fact that we don't give kids enough credit for no, how that. smart they actually are. And not so much, you know, the 14, 15, 16 year old, not the high school student, the middle school student, elementary age kids. And, you know, the fact that you spoke to uh, how competent they are, oh, how, man, cr how critically they think, I think, Actually, having the, I was never asked as a kid what I thought about what uh, what, what I wanted to learn necessarily. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that, as you say, there are benchmarks that have to be met. I'm gonna have to take math. I knew I hated math in the third grade, but I understand that it's something that Me I was too. gonna have. Me to. too. We had that in common. Yeah, man. I knew that was something I was gonna have Goodness. have to take. Um, but I do think it might be actually important at some point, and I don't know how feasible it is, but to actually give students more of a voice. When we were coming up, at least I know at my school, you know, you have a student body president, but mm -hmm. I really don't know what that student represents. I yeah. never I never recalled in the four years when I was in high school what that represented. So I say that to say, at some point, um, how feasible do you think it is to actually have, you know, the voice of the young people and not to say that they're going to get what they want because you know children are still children and yeah. they're going to think like children i want to you know i just want to play video games all day all right that's that's cool and all but hearing hearing these children sitting down and really hearing kids identifying so you really like video games so let's talk about video game animation yeah that's you're you're you know? something that's my point yeah. so is how so i guess really the question is how to how do educators make that type of how is there how, how how does that how do you marry those ideas? You know what I mean? I think it's an area of growth for us. Mm -hmm. I, I mean we're sometimes we're pretty um I don't want to say um standard, but are there, you know, here there's standards of learning, right? right? I, I think that there there is an expectation. We follow pacing guides. You know, we have mm -hmm. curriculum that has to be mastered. Right. Um, so we we spend a lot of time focused on that. Mm -hmm. Students, stu stu and listening to young people is an area of growth for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we we need to include them mm -hmm. and and their voice and their opinions more. Right. So I, I I think that's an area of growth. Sure. You know that that's something we need to focus on. I, I don't think we're where we need to be right. in education at all. Yeah. Right. Nationally. Nationally. Right. Yeah, I, I, it just again, like I said, just the conversation we had, and actually one of my volunteers, you know, at at my church, um, approached me. Uh, you know, I deal with a lot of the creative. You know, we've talked about this. I deal with a lot of the creative aspects mm -hmm. um, at my at my nine to five, and um, she has a fifteen year old who is super into uh, like into the graphic design and video editing and stuff like that. So she was like, Hey, would you mind mentoring my, my kid? Okay. Like, yeah, sure. Not a problem. So what does she do? She was like, well, right now she's actually taking uh video. Like I, like I mentioned a minute ago, video animation. I was like, well, how does she have access to that? And so she was explaining to me, it's a, it's a special program. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, how is this more, how do, how do we make, so my mind frame is, how do we make that more accessible? Because again, go. I'm 40. I'll be 40 this year, and I'm thinking video game animation. What do you? Yeah. <laughs> now that's some that's some old people who who work in Nintendo in Japan. That's their job. Yeah. That's not something that we can empower 15 year old kids right here in Hampton or Newport News. Why not? 
So that's that's what I'm saying. That was one of those things. Again, when she said it, it was an aha moment. Yeah. But it was it was not so, it wasn't something that I actively thought about being a tool for a young person to empower them Absolutely. to to keep them engaged. As she was explaining to me, you know, her daughter's interests, I actually said to her, "Tell you, tell you next time she comes to serve at the church, tell her to bring her computer, because I actually believe she's light years ahead of me, and I want to see what she's doing." Because they, now they I'm, are. and so you know, I, I really do think. That's kind of where I was getting that question about how do we in- include these young people um, and hearing their voices. But, you know, I think it's, you know, you say it's an area of growth for you guys. I mean, it's an area of, of growth for me as well, yeah. <laughs> you know. And so, and I think it's probably is for a lot of adults. Yeah. We just really need to give these kids their 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 credit. We need to really listen to them. them. Yeah. We need to listen to them. Let, let them create it. Let, yeah. let them build it. We need to listen. We need to listen to our young people. Yeah. They are brilliant. Mm-hmm. And uh, everything, yeah. everything shouldn't uh, have to go through us, right? Right. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to have you here, Rashad, man. It's I been a pleasure. You, this is cool. Um, again, Mr. Wright, uh, chief of, chief of, I was about to say chief of police. <laughs> chief, <laughs> chief of staff. Chief of staff. For but Newport just an News. educator, man. I yeah, mean, man. you know, just an educator in this area. I uh, grew up in this area. Yeah. And um, it's real cool to reconnect with you. Mm-hmm. We, we have a... Like a whole a bunch of friends, whole bunch people. of folks in common, yeah, but that's that's the energy of this area, man. Yeah. It's it's, a, it's beautiful, well, and, um, and it goes back to why um, we need to celebrate yeah. this area. Agreed, and again, been a pleasure. Um, you know, thanks for sharing. You know, your 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 time with us, um, a lot of your knowledge, and uh, yeah, this is it for us again here at the Tiny Talks. Um, education here in hampton roads virginia 757 i always forget how we sign off on these so i'm just gonna throw up two fingers yvonne wherever whichever camera you're at i don't know but uh thanks again man we appreciate it appreciate it all right no.